which Australians hate politicians, <laughs> and that after that he became one, <laughs> which is an odd choice and perhaps it shows an inclination towards self-punishment, or maybe it shows a desire to transform the system in which he now finds himself. Seems to me that he is an economist who knows that prosperity is about more than monetary wealth, and a politician who knows that governing is about more than winning. And he has a vision of society in which he's not afraid to use words like compassion and love. And so I am looking forward to hearing from Andrew Lee this evening about the politics of love. So once again, will you give him a very warm welcome? Thank you, Carolyn, for that uh, very generous introduction. May I, of course, begin by acknowledging the remedium of the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, can I thank uh, not only Carolyn Fran Francis but also Tim Costello for uh, organising tonight's event uh, and all of you for being here uh, at uh, what is, let's face it, a somewhat unusual venue for a political speech. Uh, this is the first time I've ever given a speech in a Melbourne church, which is frankly a bit neglectful, uh, given that in a very literal sense I owe my life to a Melbourne church. Let me tell you the story. In 1964, a man called Michael delivered a sermon at Ivanhoe Methodist on behalf of his father, Reverend Keith. He was lean and bookish, a runner and an academic to be. He'd been in Sarawak from Borneo. And the congregation was Barbara, a long-haired young woman who represented her school in debating championships and was training to be a teacher. She had just returned from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. They got chatting and he offered to drive her home. She lived literally a few hundred metres from the church, <laughs> but of course said yes. They talked about religion, travel and even some politics. And so my parents fell in love. In a world in which religion is too often a source of conflict, it's easy to forget that attending a church isn't just an opportunity to meet your future spouse. Although if you're single, feel free to look left, look right. <laughs> Those who attend a religious service regularly are more likely to volunteer time to community organisations, more likely to donate money, and more likely to give blood. As someone who doesn't regularly attend church, I'm keenly aware of the positive role that religious organisations can play in encouraging us to be a better version of ourselves. Politics, too, provides a chance to be a better version of ourselves. After all, as Aristotle noted, politics is simply the art of working out how to live together. Politicians were at the heart of shaping federation, creating the age pension, abolishing child labour, designing Medicare and legislating native title. I'm honoured to serve in the same profession as Churchill, Alexander Hamilton, Shinana Guzman, Aung San Suu Kyi. But when people say politics, it's a fair bet your mind doesn't go straight to Lincoln's second inaugural. Instead, you might think about the candidate that Lincoln's party has chosen this year. <laughs> a candidate who, if elected, would be the first president in American history never to have held military, executive or legislative office. Few politicians have trafficked in hatred like Donald Trump. He refers to his opponents with nicknames, Lion Ted and Crooked Hillary, and questioned their sexual prowess. He wants to bring back torture, has called women pigs, and made fun of a reporter with a disability. After the worst mass shooting in US history, Trump tweeted, appreciate the congrats for being right on Islamic terrorism. A remark at a campaign rally last week was widely interpreted as encouraging the assassination of his rival. On race, Trump has advocated a ban on Muslim migration and called Mexicans criminals and rapists. He's claimed that President Obama was born in Kenya and only gained admission to Harvard for affirmative action. 
In a television interview, Trump failed to repudiate the Ku Klux Klan. He's dismissed an American-born judge as a Mexican who could, un who could not fairly hear his case and attacked the parents of a Muslim soldier who was killed in action. Summarising Trump's behaviour over four decades, including lawsuits brought against him when he is a property developer, New York Times columnist Nick Kristof concluded, I don't see what else to report but racism. Across the Atlantic, anger is rising. A week before the Brexit vote, Labor MP Joe Cox was shot by a man shouting, death to traitors, freedom for Britain. In the days after the vote, more than 100 incidents of racial crime and hate crime were reported to police, including a school in Cambridge, where vandals left a sign saying, leave the EU, no more Polish vermin. In France, Marine Le Pen draws parallels between Muslim migrants and the occupation of her country during World War II. Joint acting Austrian President Norbert Hofer holds similar views. The perspective of immigrants as terrorists and job stealers is powerful in the politics of Hungary, Poland, Men in the Netherlands and Denmark. As The Economist puts it, across Western democracies, large numbers of people are enraged. In too many countries, voters don't merely dislike their politicians, their political opponents, they actively hate them. In the luck of politics, I use post-election surveys to calculate the share of Labor and coalition voters who say they strongly dislike the opposing Meaning that when they're asked on a 0 to 10 scale to rank their political, the opposing political party, they give it a 0. In the late 1990s, the share of people who hate their opponents was, right, risen, was just uh, less than 1 in 6. Since then, it's risen to over 1 in 4. And a similar pattern can be seen in the United States, though over a longer time period. Since the 1970s, voters' view of their own party has stayed basically unchanged. But their rating of the opposite party is halved. Partisans regard those in the other party as less intelligent, more selfish, my personal favourite, more closed minded. <laughs> in 1960, just 5% of Americans said they would be displeased if their son or daughter married outside their political party. Today, that number is 41%. Americans are more disturbed by cross-party marriages than by interracial marriages. The typical American parent is more troubled by a cross-party marriage than by learning that their son or daughter is gay or lesbian. You imagine the scene here in Australia. Oh, thank goodness, sweetheart. When, I, when you said your girlfriend was a, a lesbian, I first thought you said a liberal. <laughs> And partisans like dislike can even affect employment outcomes. Asked to choose between two hypothetical job candidates, people tend to discriminate against those who've done work in the youth wing of another political party. Partisan shows, partisanship shows up in some really weird places too. Under the Prime Ministerships of Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, the same cat, Humphrey, lived in 10 Downing Street. Yet when shown a picture of Humphrey and asked to give the cat an approval rating, Labor partisans were nearly twice as likely to approve the moggy if described as Tony Blair's cat than if described as Margaret Thatcher's cat. <laughs> Another study found that Barack Obama's dog, Bo, received a lower approval rating from people who disliked President Obama. Within parliaments, the partisan gap is wider. An intriguing new study of partisan language asked the question, if you listen to a member of the US Congress speaking for just one minute, what's the chances that you could guess his or her party? Back in 1990, the answer was 55%. Today, it's 83%. The disappearance of moderates has led to more political polarisation in the US than ever before. A similar picture emerges in Australia, where the share of crossover candidates, Labor candidates,
candidates who are to the right of the average coalition candidates or vice versa has halved since 1996. As I was discussing with a member of the congregation before, the floor of federal parliament is the only workplace I've ever been in where it's considered socially acceptable to shout insults at your co-workers <laughs> while they're trying to do their job. <laughs> now, Australian politics has always been a full contact sport, but it's getting rough. Over recent years, Annabelle Crabbs noticed the hostile, scratchy feel to politics. <laughs> while Laura Tingle claims that Australia's politics and our public discourse have become noticeably angrier. Technological shifts in the media landscape have played a part, with more media outlets now targeting a specific ideological niche. And it's a problem that's frankly made worse by the fact that many of us reach our favourite news stories through social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. If our friends curate the news we read, we're more likely to read stories that reinforce our biases rather than challenge them. So what's the best response to all this rising hate? Martin Luther King put it best when he said, I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. And I've seen hate in the faces of too many sheriffs, too many white citizens councillors, too many clansmen of the South to want to hate myself. And every time I see it, I say to myself, hate is too great a burden to bear. Instead, as King wrote in Strength to Love, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The best answer to anger in politics is an idea we don't talk about much in Australia, a politics of love. I was first introduced to the idea of the politics of love by two New Zealand thinkers, Max Harris and Philip McKibben. As progressives, they pointed out, we can sometimes get too attached to the detail of programs. Our language ends up being alienating rather than inclusive. Gonski, 0.7% of GNI, 45% emissions reductions by 2030, a TPP without ISDS. I'm an economist, so frankly I'm as guilty of this as anyone. But the thing about a politics of love is it's a politics that's grounded in everyday values. And love isn't just a value, it's the most valuable value. What do I mean by love? Well, a standard cop-out is to say that we can no more define love than a metaphorical group of blind men can define an elephant. We can take the approach to the US Supreme Court judge he said pornography was best defined by saying, I know it when I see it. <laughs> but I think we can do better. And first, it might be helpful to say that I'm not referring here to the special kind of love that Jim Cairns once professed for his chief of staff, <laughs> or the somewhat less special kinds of love that have blossomed in Canberra's infamous late night venues. We're here tonight to talk about the politics of love, not the love of politicians. <laughs> the ancient Greeks divided love into four categories. The first three are easy. Eros, erotic love. Storge, love for your family. Philip, love for your friends. The fourth, agape, is the tricky one. Agape is unconditional love for other humans. Thomas Aquinas described agape as to will the good of another. Martin Luther King called it spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless and creative. And Christians say love thy neighbour. It's agape they have in mind. Now some will balk at the idea of love going beyond your family and friends. How can we love people we barely know? It's a hard idea. Kierkegaard acknowledged just how hard when he called it perfect love. That's one way of understanding is to look for more familiar examples of agape. In the male-dominated history of the trade union movement, there's an old notion of brotherly love. 
Today, unionists proudly talk about solidarity. Not as a tactic to win the day, but as a way of life. As the song says, solidarity forever. Lately, Pope Francis has taken to talking about solidarity too. For him, it's a way of reminding ourselves that the injustices of some are the injustices of all. For the Pope, solidarity is a form of love. Comrade, a word much loved by Gough Whitlam, expresses that same sense of fellow feeling. The word comrade came into being in the 19th century. It was an egalitarian alternative to those class-bound words, sir, madam. To be a comrade was to share a passion, a passion, an interest, to be on a journey together. To be a comrade is to be an equal. Nature shares the same essence. When Whitlam poured red dirt into Vincent Lingiari's hand, Lingiari summed up the moment with we are all mates now. That mateship is Agape, and in that moment, Lingiari created perhaps the most profound moment of love and politics that Australia's ever seen. I'm aware of mates' blokey overtones, but I do like using G'day mate to greet a bus driver, a doctor, a security guard, a CEO. You can't love someone by looking down your nose. The politics of love is the politics of egalitarianism. There's a peacefulness, too, inherent in the politics of love. When Mahatma Gandhi faced down the batons and bullets of the British, he did it with nothing more than the power of his words and the strength of his conviction. Gandhi's willingness to serve time in jail for his beliefs led to a correspondence between him and Russian writer Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy, then in his final couple of years of life, praised Gandhi's non-violent campaign against British rule. And the, lesson, the letters from the Russian writer came back repeatedly to love. Tolstoy praised Gandhi for what he saw as the, high, the law of love, which stressed unity and represented the highest and only law. Essential to the politics of life is a sense of warmth and respect towards others. Rather than regarding those of different gender, sexuality, class, race as enemies to be crushed, the politics of love requires an attitude of care towards those who are different from us. A politics of love doesn't stop at the edge of our political party. Jimmy Carter described it as a love of unlovable people who don't love us back. So yes, the politics of love must even include the National Party. <laughs> <laughs> because the politics of love is inclusive, it doesn't stop the Australian continental shelf. As the saying goes, charity begins at home but doesn't end there. My former employer, Michael Kirby, argues that love expands our circle of regard to people's everywhere. He says the essential underpinning Fundamental human rights is love. Love for one another, empathy for fellow human beings. Love of the agape kind is international. Well, enough of generalities. After all, I know what the economists in the room are asking. Does the politics of love pass across benefits? <laughs> well, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked. So let's turn to a few specific, specific examples to see how a politics of love could change the way politics is practiced today. Let's start with Indigenous policy, an issue on which there's plenty of reasons for non-Indigenous Australians like me to feel guilty. Our ancestors committed the murders, stole the children, and practiced official discrimination. Even today, progress on closing the gap targets is frustratingly slow. A politics of love should create a sense of urgency. Because we're all Australians, we all deserve a fair go. The national apology to the stolen generations was an act of love. A moment in which, as Kevin Rudd put it, the nation was wrestling with our own soul. 
plenty of puppies that day, and plenty of tears. There's plenty more work to be done. But Indigenous reconciliation also requires a sense of celebration, a touch of pride in the achievements of the Cathy Freemans, the Robert Thomases, the Faith Bandlers, the Adam Bruces. A politics of love should bring a smile to our lips <coughs> when non-Indigenous Australians recall how lucky we are to share this continent with a people whose link, continuing link to the land is longer than that of any other community in the world. We think of the Romans, the Greeks, the Assyrians as ancient civilizations, but sometimes we forget that Indigenous Australians, our Indigenous Australians, have been around for tens of thousands of years before those civilizations emerged. And Indigenous Australian civilization is still here today. It's not to love about that. Or take welfare policy, where there's emerged a worrying tendency to divide the population into us and them. In Britain, it's strivers and scholars. In the United States, it's the 47% who are dependent on government. In Australia, it's the language of leaners and leaders. Now, one response to this is to point out that social policy is more like insurance than transfers. Sure, only 20% of the population get welfare in any given year, but if you look over a decade and a half, around 70% of us, at some point, live in a household that gets welfare. But the politics of love is an answer to that question that burrows deeper into our hearts. It reminds us that any of us could experience the bad luck of job loss, disability or family violence. It was what led Australians to support increasing the Medicare rate to part finance the National Disability Insurance Scheme. There's no them in the politics of love. There's only us. In international affairs, there's been a trend in Australia over recent years to withdraw from helping the rest of the world. We've cut foreign aid, cut the refugee intake, increased our carbon emissions in the electricity sector. Often the justification of it is we have to take care of ourselves first. That misses the fact that altruism can be in our self-interest. Foreign aid reduces the risk of terrorism. Asylum seekers can make great entrepreneurs. There are scads of new jobs and renewables. But even if these facts weren't true, we should still engage with the world because it's the right thing to do. If I saw a child drowning in the yard, no one would think it was reasonable for me to stand on the edge because to dive in might ruin my suit. And yet, saving a life through foreign aid costs much less than the price of a suit. As Peter Singer points out, if we believe in the universal value of human life, we should be willing to share some of our wealth with the less fortunate. The politics of love requires us to value citizens of other countries. Speaking to parliamentarians recently, Tim Costello talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Tim made the point that because the victim has been beaten and stripped of his clothes, he lacks the outward signs that would ordinarily denote which group he belongs to. To be a good, good Samaritan, Tim pointed out, is to help people because they are human, not because they're part of our tribe. Or take discrimination. In the case of race, we've already seen how Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi drew on love in their campaigns for racial justice. When it comes to sexism, Bell Hooks makes a similar case. When men embrace feminist thinking, she argues, they move from thinking of the world through domination and coercion, to valuing mutual growth and emotional well-being. Feminist politics, Bell Hooks writes, is not only good for women, it's good for men. Feminism brings us from lovelessness to loving. We'll take same-sex marriage, of which I'm a strong supporter. But this is a sharp-edged way of making the case for marriage equality which focuses on the need to scrap prejudice and remove discrimination. 
Some have argued that if you oppose same-sex marriage, you're a homophobe. I can recognise the anger among those who waited a long time to marry. In Canberra, same-sex marriage was legal for five days in 2013, during which time 31 same-sex couples tied the knot. Three years on, their marriages remain void. That happened to me, I'd be said. But when we look at the most successful campaigns for same-sex marriage, they often have the word love in their title. In the United States, Mildred Loving, whose Supreme Court case, Loving v Virginia, ended miscegenation in 1967, was a strong supporter for equal marriage. In 2007, the year before she died, she said, I believe all Americans, no matter their race, no matter their sex, no matter their sexual orientation, should have the same freedom to marry. I'm still not a political person, but I'm proud that Richard, with my name, is on a court case that can help reinforce the love, the commitment, the fairness, and the family of so many people, black or white, young or old, gay or straight, seeking life. I support the freedom to marry for all. That's what loving and loving are all about. In 2015, when the US Supreme Court secured equal marriage, we celebrated on social media with the hashtag Love Wins. Ireland's referendum for that year saw posters saying, This is about love and equality and nothing else. One campaign website was simply voteforlove.ie. Opposing same sex marriage in the abstract is easier than when it's about real people who are in love. As a member of Parliament, I'm privileged to hear many of these stories. Christy, the daughter of Meg, tells me how much it would mean to her if her mother could marry her father, Anne Marie. And she thinks that Lily, Meg's granddaughter, would love to be a flower girl. <laughs> Daniel Edmonds wrote to me, When I was young, I asked my grandmother what her view would be on having a gay grandchild. Her response was steadfast. I could not support it, she said. It would be against God and against everything I believe in. Years later, I came out to my family before leaving home to move to university. An economics degree, he added. <laughs> my grandmother was unsteady in the knowledge that she now had a gay grandchild, something that was uncommon in North Queensland at the time. It was years before she was able to bring it up in conversation with me. However, when she finally did, it really moved. I want you to know that I will always support you and love you, no matter who you love. Ever since then, she's met my partners, opened her arms to them as part of the family, and consoled me when those relationships didn't last. I'm very lucky to still have my grandmother, but I only regret that in all likelihood my grandmother will not be able to attend my wedding day. I appreciate you fighting for the rights for future grandmothers, grandfathers, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters be able to attend the wedding days of their beloved family members. And then there was Bill, a non-practicing Catholic, who wrote to tell me he opposed same-sex marriage. We had a brief email exchange and he said he was grateful I treated his position with respect. Then a few months later, Bill emailed again to say he'd changed his mind. The turning point had been a dinner party attended by an older gay couple. He wrote, these two elderly men, Lee and Craig, had been together for many years, and their love and affection for each other was so great and so touching, I felt ashamed of the position I had held, which would deny them the dignity of being able to express their love for each other, as every other Australian can. Finally, the politics of love should shape how we practice politics. Trust in government and politicians is now as low as it's been in two decades. Only 5% of Australians agree that people in government can be trusted to do the right thing nearly all the time. Only 2% say they trust members of parliament very much. At this point I'm starting to think that the only reason I've got your attention is that you think if you 
Turn your backs, I'll steer the boat. <laughs> now, Australians have never put their political leaders on pedestals. Not in the days of Ben Shipley, Robert Menzies, Bob Hawke or Paul Kelly. But it is apparent we're rating very low. Roy Morgan regularly asks Australians to rate the ethics and honesty of people in different occupations. And politicians typically fall near the bottom, along with stockbrokers and real estate agents. It's scant con consolation, the profession that regularly report this fact, journalists are rated about the same ones. <laughs> when I co-edited a book on trust in politicians in 2002, our publisher chose a cover image of one dog sniffing another dog's backside. <laughs> and it hasn't got, gotten any better since then. In part, distrust of politicians reflects a general decline in civic engagement, which has seen a decline in membership of community groups, attendance of church services, union membership and formal vote. Compared with past generations, Australians have fewer friends and are less likely to know our neighbours. Less likely to play an organised sport, less likely to attend music concerts. Bad behaviour by politicians isn't the only reason for distrust, but it doesn't help. People often see their parliamentarians on the televisions shouting, accusing one another of lying, or otherwise doing things for which most parents would send their child to the naughty corner. That angry politics I talked about earlier is a turn off for many voters. The thing is, distrust isn't just a plague on both our houses. Progressives like me are more likely to be making the case that government has a role in addressing injustice. The risk is that if people think politics is broken, they're more likely to believe that government is broken. Barack Obama, for the best, when he was running for president, arguing that no matter how angry Democrats were at the nasty tactics of republics, Republicans, it would be a mistake to copy them. He said, I believe any attempt by Democrats to pursue a more sharply partisan and ideological strategy misapprehends the moment we're in. I am convinced that whenever we exaggerate or demonise, oversimplify or overstate our case, we lose. When we dumb down at the political debate, we lose. My side of politics needs government to work to work more than our opponents do. And so we need politics to work more than our opponents do. Now, putting love in doesn't mean taking politics out. US Senator Cory Booker showed that when he spoke about love at the recent Democratic National Convention, including with a wry smile, in America, love always trumps hate. <laughs> A politics of love doesn't mean compromising on our values or accepting the mush in the middle. There are plenty of issues on which I firmly believe my side is right and the other side is wrong. And the primacy of the two-party system around the globe reflects the fact that it is a valuable framework for debating big questions. But a politics of love does mean that we always need to have in the back of our mind that how we practice politics matters as much as the outcomes on a particular piece of legislation. Politics is not a game. At its best, it's a noble profession. As former Canadian Liberal Party leader Michael Ignatieff noted in his wonderful book, Fire and Ashes, it's always worth having in mind the young person at the back of the room. Hello. And thinking about how to speak with, to them in a way that they can be inspired learn from your mistakes, and one day come back to do a better job than you did. <coughs> now, in speaking about life, I recognise that I might be raising more questions than I answer. You might reasonably ask how a politics of love can coexist with sending our troops to take the lives of others, with a policy that says that refugees who come by boat won't be resettled in Australia, or with taking corporate political donations. Each of those ethical questions could merit a speech in its own right. In brief, I answer the first by invoking the theory of just war. 
The second, by saying that asylum seeker policy must find a way of ending the suffering of those in Manus and Nauru without consigning others to the fate of the sea deck victims. And the third, by noting that it's not much good having the right message if you can't communicate. Similarly, more technocratic areas of government aren't necessarily amenable to an injection of emotion. What does the politics of love mean for the Reserve Bank's understanding of the transmission mechanisms for monetary policy? For air safety directives issued by the Civil Avi Aviation Safety Authority? Or whether it's in the national interest to encourage competition between stock markets? You might have an answer. My first thought is not very much. Indeed, my own belief in wonkish ideas like randomised policy trials doesn't fit neatly into the frame of life. But just because we can't fit everything into a politics of love doesn't mean we shouldn't fit anything into a politics <coughs> of love. If you're, what you end up taking away today is politics needs a bit more love, it's okay with me. In one sense, the politics of love is a fresh idea. In another, it's an ancient one. The New Zealand Maori concept of aloha is similar to the Greek agape. Aloha is a love for living things, a genuine concern for all, no matter their health or their wealth. Latin American, Asian, African and European thinkers have at times advanced variants on the notion of the politics of love. In her book, why Love Matters for Justice, philosopher Martha Nussbaum notes that many of those who have transformed their countries have drawn on an ethic of love, including Nehru, FDR, Mandela, and Vaclav Havel. Every now and then, I'll get an email from someone who's been touched by something I've said or written. It doesn't happen often, maybe once every 10,000 emails. When someone writes to say that I've helped renew their faith in politics, encourage them to get engaged in labour, or just made them proud of their MP, it makes my heart swell a size. And when I think back to what prompted those emails, it's not me getting angry or coming up with a pithy insult. It's not even what I've quoted a little known statistic. Instead, it's when I've told a story about someone who's inspired, when I've offered hope, or when I've expressed gratitude. It's when I've shown vulnerability, grace, or love. We can place a lot of emphasis in politics on cleverness, in designing the smartest policies, forging cunning plans that will make the politics work. And that stuff does matter. But I'm increasingly interested in wisdom, how to live a good life, and how to be of service to others. More smiles, fewer scouts. Because narrowness and nastiness tend to go together, I'm keen to expand the political conversation. There should be space in our polity for people who are introverted, gentle, or more softly spoken. I can't promise to practice the politics of love all the time, but I'm going to try it a little more. Because love, like all of us, is a work in progress. Thanks very much.